Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular Friday program of the City Club of Portland. A special welcome to our radio audience, City Club members who are present, and their guests. I'm Mary Kramer, president of the club. As is our usual procedure, I will introduce our new members first. They are scattered throughout the audience today, so I'll ask them to stand as I call their names and remain standing till all have been introduced. First of all is Michael Hips, president of Sterling Associates, Mary Narquist of Narquist and Associates, Walter Roberts, business development executive, the computer store, and Nancy Stanley, division manager, nationwide insurance. Let's give them a warm welcome. We're glad you're with us. I'd also like to thank City Club members who helped these members join the club. They are Donna Accord, Barbara Fields, Eva Parsons, and Don Sterling. We appreciate your continued effort on our behalf. A few announcements about upcoming programs. On Thursday, January 31st, we have an open forum scheduled. Keeping our metropolitan area green, open space options. This is sponsored by our Land Use and Transportation Standing Committee and features Richard Carson, Planning Director of Metro, Bowen Blair, Director of the Trust for Public Lands, Michael Houck, Urban Naturalist, Audubon Society of Portland, and Ron Klein, Environmental Affairs Representative of Portland General Electric. This meets at noon, it'll last till 1.30. It will be held at U.S. Bank Corp Tower, Conference Room B and C, on the 26th floor. It is free and open to the public. All are welcome. A week from today, we will have Ruth Masinga, Chief Executive Officer of the Casey Family Program and President of the American Public Welfare Association, and Stephen Minnick, Administrator of Oregon Adult and Family Services Division. They'll discuss welfare reform, both on the national and state level. We'll be back here at the Hilton. We want to let our radio audience know that they are welcome to be a member, excuse me, not only to be a member, but to be a guest at a Friday program if they'd like to come. All they have to do is make a reservation, call the City Club office at 228-7231 by 5 p.m. on Wednesday. They should talk to Jenny and she'll make them a reservation. We look forward to those people who would like to be guests and join us. I also have to remind you that the Benson is undergoing extensive renovations. So we'll be meeting primarily in the next few months here at the Hilton. There are a couple of times we won't be here, so please check your bulletin before you leave to come to the Friday program. I have one other announcement today. Many of you already know Sherry Osier, our research director has accepted a position with Metro. She's going to be a management analyst. We're sad to see her go. We appreciate all her hard work. And Sherry, where are you? There she is. Let's wish her well. Until we fill the position, Nancy Hedin, our executive director, will be filling in as research director. Nancy, why don't you stand so everybody can see you? Thank you, Nancy. We are, have not advertised this open position yet. We're going to take a look at it and we'll let you know when the uh, search process is going to begin. So we're not ready to accept any applications. So keep them in your back pocket and be ready when we have the search ready to go. Our board host today, seated with our speaker, is Pete Baer. 
He is a member of the Board of Governors and Treasurer of the Club and a loan officer for National Mortgage Company. He will have the privilege of asking the first question today. The second question today will be asked by Mark Abrams, member of the Education Standing Committee and an attorney with Bogle and Gates. As is our usual procedure, we will open to questions from City Club members. The mic will be on the floor somewhere in this area and uh, we ask you to step there to ask your questions. We give preference to those people who do go to the mic to ask their questions. There are, however, cards on the table should you wish to write a question and submit it. The staff who is over here will pick them up if you have written questions. Be sure to hold them high enough so they can see them. Now for today's program. In 1988, President Bush vowed to be remembered as the education president. Well, with the events of a recession on the forefront, a war, and ballot measure five here in Oregon, it's hard to remember or believe those words, and the prospects of a rosy education picture seem dim. If you've been following the predictions about the effects of ballot measure five, you've read that Oregon's higher education's share of the cuts leave the system $90 million short. This week, the University of Oregon talks about cutting 60 teachers and reducing enrollment by 2,000. And it's been suggested that we have a 20% increase in tuition. This is a mixed potpourri of hopes, dreams, and reality. And amidst that, the Governor's Commission on Higher Ed in the metro area calls for PSU to become an urban grant university. What does that mean? How do we get from here to there? How much will it cost? Our speaker is optimistic, and better yet, has a vision. Dr. Judith A. Romali became PSU's sixth president in January. She's a neuroendocrinologist holding degrees from Swarthmore and the University of California at Los Angeles. She's a teacher and a researcher with more than 65 published articles. Examples of her academic administrative titles are Associate Dean of Research at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, State University of New York at Albany, and Executive Vice Chancellor of the University of Kansas at Lawrence. And she's had the time and energy to be deeply involved in several professional organizations, like the National Association of State Universities and land-grant colleges. Her experiences and credentials have had helped shape her vision she has for PSU as an urban grant university. Let's hear more. We are in need of a ray of hope for higher education in Oregon. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Romali. Save it for after my speech. <laughs> This morning, a member of my staff told me that, that shortly after Lawrence, Kansas was the site of the filming of the day after, there was a cartoon that ran in the Oregonian that showed Dorothy holding her dog Toto, saying sadly, well, Toto, I guess we never can go back there anymore. <laughs> and uh, he threatens to send that to me with Measure 5 written on the cloud, which is in the background. Let me start out by complimenting the City Club because you have an admirable record of informed interest in higher education. One of the things I've been doing since I came to Portland was going back to find out what wisdom there is to guide a newcomer and have found that there is a great deal. The City Club has had a committee which in 1978 reported on the role of Portland State University in the community. And that report is worth reading again. 
any of you who might have been involved in that, you were remarkably perspicacious, as were a lot of other people thinking about education in Portland during that period, echoed, of course, in the recent Governor's Commission report. I'd like to quote from that particular report, just so that you know that I pay attention to good advice whenever it's given, even if I wasn't here at the time. Quote, a permanent advisory council should be established with membership comprised predominantly of representatives of the community and the balance representing PSU administration, faculty, and students. Community members should include business, labor, professional and political leaders, minorities, and just plain folks. Well, I've been here six months and I haven't met a just plain folks yet, but, but I've met some of the others. I've recently reconstituted that particular group and it has proven exactly as helpful as the City Club thought it would. We have a President's Advisory Council and a Companion Advisory Board, which are just two of many groups that support the university. In fact, we have about 250 members of the community, including no doubt some people here in the audience, I've already spotted a few, who help us in one way or another on our alumni board, our foundation board, advisory boards to our academic programs, or my own two boards that are giving me so much support and encouragement. My topic today, derived in part from conversations with people like you in the audience and also listening on the radio, is the urban university and its future in Oregon. Given passage of Measure 5, I might add, our future is the same, but we have to think very creatively about how we're going to get there. In the next few minutes, I want to take a look at the powerful challenge of change. Change at the university, change in the community. Change in the way this region lives and works, in how higher education must organize itself to meet these changing ways of living, working, and learning, and the challenge of what is coming upon us as a result of Measure 5, and how the state ultimately will decide how much higher education it will provide in the public sector in the context of all the other services it must provide to the citizens of this state. I also want to take a look at Portland State University as it is today, significantly different from the institution that was described in your own report of 1978. And finally, how are we at Portland State reacting to both the problems and the opportunities afforded by all of these changes, including the challenge presented to us by the voters who passed Measure 5? The evidence of change is all around us. Change in economic systems, political systems, most recently and painfully military alliances and international relationships. Closer to home in Oregon, a state once marked by a resource-based economy, relative geographic isolation, and a tradition of slow-paced development, we now find ourselves adopting a whole new set of characteristics in order to compete successfully in a new world economy. Among these new characteristics are the rapid growth of this region, our new emphasis on advanced technology and communication and the emergence of growth industries that support those technologies, internationalization, extensive ties with countries bordering the Pacific, and a sensitivity to international economic trends. The earlier, slower pace of development, which I've heard about from people who've lived here a long time or who have studied the history of the region, allowed an extraordinarily strong sense of community to develop here in Portland. The era we are now leaving fostered extraordinarily enlightened public policy choices, growth management and land use plans, the light rail system, the public parks and beaches, attributes that make not only this state but this part of the state truly a wonderful place in which to live. And it is a concern for these attributes coupled with the knowledge that we must find ways to participate in the new economic and social order that we are now seeing unfold in front of us, that has led to a virtual flurry of reports and strategic plans. Association for Portland Progress planned for the year 2000, Portland Future Focus, Metro's Regional Urban Growth Goals and Objectives, and most importantly to me, perhaps, the Governor's Commission on Higher Education in the Portland metropolitan area which completed its work only in November. One curious thing to me as an educator is that with the exception of the Governor's Commission, which was constituted specifically to study the issue of higher education, 
The role of the state's public and private educational systems receives relatively short shrift in reports like this, and this is a very serious omission, and I'll tell you why. The most recent figures we have show that there are over 52,000 students in public post-secondary educational programs in the metropolitan area, studying at Portland State, the Health Sciences University, and our three community colleges. If we then add to that the 23,000 students that are in the remaining independent institutions for a total, when you combine the two, of 31 different institutions, you have nearly 75,000 people who are furthering their education in Portland at the undergraduate or graduate level. Portland State awards 41% of the undergraduate degrees and two-thirds of the graduate degrees conferred in this city and this region every year and serves approximately 25% of the students in the region, the majority of the remainder, of course, being served by the community college system. But those enrollment figures, the 52,000 public and 23,000 private, are just the precursor of what is to come. A common theme in all the reports and strategic plans is that growth will come, and it is coming rapidly. Portland was one of the fastest growing regions in the country in 1989, and is projected to be one of the top six boom towns in the decade of the 90s. The economists at the recent Oregon Business Forecast panel, while they didn't all agree on the economy, did agree on something else, which is that more people are going to be moving into Portland and into Oregon. And they won't all come from California. Some come from foreign places like Kansas, for example. <laughs> and none of them will look back. For better or worse, Oregon is part of the mega growth Pacific corridor that stretches from the beaches of Southern California to the forests of Vancouver Island. Over 1.4 million people live in this metro area today and another half million will be year, here by the year 2010, which is one year before I retire and I intend to get out of the way by then. <laughs> Think of that. Our population will grow by more than one third in a mere 20 years and our high school graduates will increase by 25%. Both of these trends will increase the pressure on higher education and in particular on Portland State, which serves nearly two thirds of the people who are getting advanced degrees. It will also put pressure on our educational institutions for continuing professional education. With a community expanding like this, the role of higher education becomes more critical than it ever was before as an element in attracting and retaining business, as a factor in stabilizing and enhancing community life, and as a partner in identifying and responding to community problems and to community opportunities. These trends will have a profound impact on Portland State University. We cannot make educational policy in Oregon without recognizing the implications of the location of Portland in this corridor. We must make the kind of public policy decisions that will result in a higher education system and institutions that will assure all Oregonians full participation in the developing global world. If we fail, we risk, as several people have now said in letters to the Oregonian, becoming a West Coast Appalachia, an economically disadvantaged state in an otherwise thriving economic corridor. Right across the Columbia River, we see the first stage of a major new public investment in higher education by our sister institution, Washington State, which is developing a university campus in Vancouver. And what are we doing? We're cutting the budgets of our public universities and colleges. Critical to the success of a new higher educational configuration in this country, I believe, will be the emergence and recognition of a new kind of institution, of which Portland State is an example, the Urban Grant University. In this particular community, because of its history, because of its geographical structure, because of the nature of its educational system, we have a chance to create a model of an urban university that will set the pace for the nation. And why do I say that? In higher education today, there are many different kinds of colleges and universities, some of them public and some of them private. They differ in their missions, in their locations, in their size, their scope, and their purpose. Portland State, an urban university, shares a common heritage with these sister institutions, 
a concern for human questions that extend beyond any particular time or particular place, an academic base rooted in the liberal arts and sciences and the performing arts. The difference, however, between our mission and those of these other types of institution is in emphasis. These differences are outlined in a brief description we've provided, and I think there's some on the table. I'm not sure if we got them all around the room. I see some here and there. It's titled The Urban University, and it's your one-page primer on everything I've learned in six months, and if there are any educators in the audience, I would appreciate a grade after the class. <laughs> in order to help our enrollment, I have enrolled in a one-credit-hour self-study program. Laugh if you will, but I'll do it if I have to. <laughs> Please note the direct, in fact, the intimate ties between this new urban university and the community, yourselves. Much of our academic program, our basic and applied research, our faculty, staff, and students are associated with this urban community. We live and work here, we care about this place, and our interests reflect that. And that is the difference. An urban university couldn't evolve in a rural environment. They draw their strengths and they give strengths to their urban centers and that's what this institution will do as well. And this difference requires a new organization. Questions in the community do not come in simple terms. The answers require many approaches and the sharing of ideas and expertise. In other words, the questions aren't organized the way academic departments are or the way that the body of knowledge we profess is organized. Questions don't arise as a philosophical question or a political science question or a civil engineering question. They arise as multidisciplinary, multidimensional problems. And new academic organizations are required, new ways for faculty to relate to one another and to students, not only across department lines but across institutional lines and across the lines between the public sector and the private sector, and between education, business, and the community. For us, the payoff is that we can achieve a national and international reputation as an urban university if we first and foremost serve you first. It is no longer possible for the city to plan its future alone. More and more, we must think as a region and work to assure that our future growth retains a healthy central city linked in meaningful ways to the counties that make up this region, not only the three Oregon counties, but Clark County and Washington State as well. And this reality shapes the mission of Portland State, whose configuration both physically and intellectually must reflect the structure of this extraordinarily interesting and vital greater metropolitan community. At a first-class university of the kind that I'm describing, the old boundaries between university and community, between study and service, between research and teaching, between theory and application, gradually disappear, and they become facets of the same thing. Scholarship is any creative approach to questions of importance to society. In the classroom, we tend to call it teaching. In the community, we call it service. And in the laboratory or studio or research library, we call it research or creative work. But wherever it occurs, its goal is the same, to serve people. The methods are the same. What difference is who asks the question and who cares about the answer. We are creating a new kind of university, one that will respond to the changing needs of this region. And because of the status of Portland as an emerging global city, Portland State University, reflecting the character of this region, will play also a national and international role. If we want our university system in this country to be the envy of the world, which we claim today, but which is gradually eroding, we will have to change. Portland State is truly the university of tomorrow here today. The seeming paradox is that to be world class, Portland State University first has to attend to the needs of the 1.4 million people who live in this region. We have the advantage that Portland, due to both planning and good fortune, has a chance to be recognized as a national model for regional growth and development. We sit at Portland State in the South Park blocks at the hub of this region, and we are as much a vital part of this community as your public schools, the transportation system, the network of public services, and the communication systems that must tie this region together as a community. 
All of this, these advantages and challenges of our urban location and mission are figuring into a strategic planning process that we started this fall and that we will include community people in, in a variety of different ways. We have a large group of faculty and staff and students currently engaged in the planning effort and when we get our draft mission and goal statement put together later on in this winter term, we will involve the wider community in a process of review and comment. Our thought is that we will invent this university with you, not for you. So here we are, an emerging urban university singled out for a critical special mission by the Governor's Commission in the midst of a major strategic planning effort, literally to redefine ourselves in the light of some of the changes I've just described, on top of the world, and suddenly, Measure 5. When Measure 5 passed, my spirits sagged a little bit. After all, even presidents are human. But I thought about it, and I said to myself, self? Well, I don't call myself by my first name. I don't know myself that well, so I just said self. You can look at this in two ways, as a disaster or an opportunity. I thought for about 10 seconds, and given my personality, which my own grandfather described as the salt of the earth, but stubborn, I had to go for opportunity. What we have at Portland State right now is nothing less than a challenge to restructure completely this newest and most significant of Oregon's universities. I've told my colleagues we're faced with a situation which will require us to reduce our budget but what we're really going to do is to reshape Portland State University. We also face a situation where we're required to provide more service, not less. And we could, if we wished, choose to pair our budget in a punitive way. We could lock off programs and services. We could pull in our, upon ourselves and, and limit our connections with the community. Or, and what we intend to do instead, is we can look for creative ways to organize ourselves to minimize the effects of Measure 5 and maximize the effectiveness of our university by reducing administrative costs, by consolidating programs, by streamlining how we operate the campus. And we're doing it. I'm very excited about what we're doing. We're doing it in combination with faculty and staff and students who are providing good ideas and we're gathering thoughts about ways to save money and improve our programs. And then we will go through in, in an internal process of consultation and testing and feedback and I can say that within two weeks, you will have a sneak preview of our provisional budget because we will release it and you will know what we're up to. We're taking a fresh look at all sorts of assumptions that large organizations like a university rarely revisit or question, partly due to lack of time, partly due to lack of opportunity, and partly due to lack of incentive. We have received an incentive. Most of you have probably not heard Measure 5 described as an incentive. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe it either, but that's all right. <laughs> this is not an easy process. To begin with, we're up against some pretty tough economic realities. First, we've already been told to cut about a million dollars out of this year's budget. That's money that was already scheduled for expenditure by June 30th. On the other hand, I suppose you could say that's kind of a warm-up exercise for the next biennium. I've chosen not to think of it that way, but one could. We also have to tie our experience into a statewide picture. A recent Oregonian article pointed out that Oregon's per capita tax obligation is about $1,600 annually, which is about $200 below the national average. Now, let, if we factor in the effects of Measure 5, our per, per capita tax obligation will fall dramatically, and only five states will have lower figures, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Arkansas, and West Virginia. We, were we talking about Appalachia earlier? I thought it would be interesting to look at how those five states fund higher education. So I asked for current per student expenditures for higher education, the most recent data we could get, which was last year. Interestingly enough, four of those five states are in the top 20 states per, per student expenditure, including Alabama, which is seventh in the nation. Only West Virginia is below 20th. It ranks 40th, which is one notch above us because we're 41st. And I don't particularly want to be compared with West Virginia, although if there are West Virginians in the audience, don't take it personally. Oregon is right below West Virginia as 41 in the nation in terms of per student expenditure and per capita expenditure. In fact, 
Oregon doesn't rank terribly high on any aspect of higher education funding. Per capita spending for higher ed, 36th. Percent of per capita income expended on higher education, 38th. Faculty salary, 45th. All before Measure 5 takes effect. Now, what about tuition? One of the ways we will have to make up lost revenue is through increased tuition. We've heard suggestions of as much as $200 per term as a surcharge or $600 a year for a full-time student studying in the universities of the Oregon State System. On top of the already scheduled tuition increase for next year, which has already been refinanced in our budget in the governor's preliminary budget, we're talking a 40% increase in tuition. Already, Oregon ranks 16th amongst public, private, uh, excuse me, public colleges and state universities in our undergraduate tuition. With the surcharge, we would rise to sixth. And that isn't a chart I want to be on the top of. There are other charts I'd like to be at the top, but not on that one. The price of an education is a particularly critical issue at Portland State, which has a special obligation to educate large numbers of students who can least afford this kind of tuition increase. The picture is even worse for graduate level tuition where Oregon currently ranks third in the nation and with a surcharge would move to second. Now let's put that together. Second on the chart for cost, 41st or worse on the chart for how much we spend per student. Measure five itself is an important event, but it's also part of a larger continuum of public policy in Oregon that has led to consistent underfunding of higher education. To quote my favorite historian, Kim McCall, we've tried in this state to travel first class on a steerage ticket. I gather he stole that from somebody, but I don't remember who. Historians do that. <laughs> Unless we're able to prevent stage two of measure five from kicking in, we will discourage people from seeking a higher education here, and we won't have much of an educational system for them to study in if they wished. And we will be well on our way to dismantling public higher education. It's clear to me that we are moving rapidly from state-supported higher ed to state-assisted, and that shift will require substantial ways that we have to change how we do business. We can handle the first biennium of Measure 5 at Portland State, and we will do so. But we cannot sustain any deeper cuts than that. We cannot allow Stage 2 of the Measure 5 initiative to happen. We must have a tax reform by that time. If we approach this critical time with a mentality of cutting and slashing public services in order to meet current exigencies, we will all have failed the test of leadership. Let there be no doubt about how I intend to respond as president of Portland State to both the direction of higher education funding in Oregon and to the message in Measure 5. I will leave absolutely no stone unturned to develop the most advanced model of an urban university in this country. No part of our university will be left unchanged no one's life will be the same. It will be extraordinarily painful, but we will do it. And in the process, we're calling forth from our faculty and staff and students and community leaders some of the best and most creative thinking our university could ever hope to achieve. The scope of this restructuring is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. IBM, for example, one of our most successful corporations, has undergone three major shifts in major restructuring in the past 10 years, and half of the corporations in the Fortune 500 have restructured twice in the past decade. We have a wealth of information and ideas and advice here in Portland on how to restructure, how to preserve and enhance our programs at the same time, and how to live through the experience. Higher educational institutions, especially those in rapidly changing urban centers like this, must move away from traditional models to new ways of organizing and delivering service and new sources of revenue. There is an interesting paradox in Oregon. I have met with many business and corporate leaders. I sit on the board of the Association for Portland Progress. I have attended a number of events like the annual Coldwell Banker Briefing on the state's economy. I visited state-of-the-art corporate headquarters in this area, which caused me to eat my heart out. I'd love a campus like that. All around us are signs of economic growth. The business environment here is at the top of the national rating services, and our business leadership is exceptionally strong and able. But I'm struck by the distance between these desirable and highly visible aspects of corporate success and the students I pass by every day who are sitting on the hallway outside our underfunded student computer lab, hoping they can get a free machine before they have to go to their class that evening. The growing gap between private sector investment and public sector investment in Oregon is alarming. 
This lagging public sector investment is contributing to major problems in the social fabric of this state. Pressure on our K through 12 system, racial tensions, problems for social structure, the elderly, etc. My vision is that Portland's higher educational system can emulate the kind of leadership and create the kind of national standing that is guiding our corporate world here in Portland. The Governor's Commission has suggested that, and with a strong Portland State University at the center of this region, and with regional affiliations through associations with our community colleges and community groups, I believe Portland can be a national model for a university community partnership, and I pledge myself to making that happen, and I know that I have the support of the faculty and staff at the university to achieve that goal. But to be what you want us to be, what your public commissions and advisory boards have encouraged us to be, we must have reasonable financial support. All the reorganization and all the streamlining in the world won't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It won't help us if we can't pay faculty a reasonable salary, if we can't obtain books and equipment, if students can't afford to attend Portland State. There's no point in working hard to maintain access to mediocrity. We must achieve quality and we must maintain access to that quality. And if the state can't provide sufficient funding, then the community, you folks out here, must do so. We're as important to the future of this region as transportation, as the availability of investment capital, as, as important as roads and utilities. So I ask you to join with me in a very worthy enterprise. Change is our daily experience. <coughs> And Portland State will be an important partner in understanding the changes that will happen in Portland and in responding to the impact of that change. To assure access to higher education in this unique urban area for all of our citizens, regardless of economic circumstance and at all times in their lives. To build a great urban university that proudly carries the name of this city and reflects the rose of this city and its new seal. To open the doors of educational opportunity for our citizens, not to close them to encourage enrollment growth, not enrollment caps, to keep alive the dream of opportunity at the end of the Oregon Trail, not just for a privileged few, but for everyone. And after all, our work is with the most precious investment capital of all. Our work is with human capital. Thank you. Bear, treasurer of the club, has the privilege of asking the first question. Pete. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Judith. I, I'm going to approach this uh, question a little carefully since I'm a member of the private sector and also a graduate of Portland State University. The, the leadership, the strong uh, corporate leadership in the Portland area that you mentioned. The fact that we have a concentration of uh, large employers. The fact that a lot of the PSU graduates are located uh, in the Portland area. I'm wondering what types of public-private uh, partnerships you might envision to not only supplement financing, but also to enhance the visibility of Portland State University, not only in the state, but also in the nation. I'll tell you in two weeks, how's that? <laughs> in fact, we're looking at that, but I'll give you a couple of examples. The kinds of partnerships we're talking about are ones in which our scholarly capacities can be meshed with the needs of the community so that we can manage the growth and economic development and social structure and environmental quality of the region together. For instance, uh, we're participating with regional groups on environmental quality and we have a doctoral program in environmental sciences and there are a number of projects we could do together that local companies and local communities and local government, even after Measure 5, could pool their resources to make possible so that we could not only do work that would make life better in Portland, but could then become models that the nation would look at and 
continue the kinds of articles about Portland that you saw in The Economist a few months ago, describing us as one of the most inviting, imaginative, and creative cities in the world. I'd like to stay there in those kinds of articles. And Portland State's particular research capacities mesh very nicely with the real needs of Portland. We're going to create an institute for Portland Metropolitan Studies that will tie our faculty and student expertise with those of people in the community to do specific projects so that we can together in, in, invent the next decade of development for Portland. Those are the kinds of things I had in mind. On the corporate side or on the small business side, we need to look at ways to support the emerging opportunities in Portland. I met just yesterday with two representatives of the software industry who talked about the idea that we could create in Oregon a center for defining quality in software and we could have an Oregon index that would be just like a major underwriting index of any other kind of equipment, and except in this case it's software, that would define quality in Oregon terms and put us on the map across the world if we had given a stamp of approval to a particular program that it was indeed of the quality that a, a, a prospective buyer would hope to find. That's just an example where we'd have to invent together what should those quality indices be? How could our new center for software quality research participate with the small companies that are forming, several hundred of them I gather, all quite small and all by themselves unable to do this but collectively able to do it, to establish a new pattern of recognition of the quality of what we do in Portland and in Oregon. Uh, we could go on. There are many such examples, and every day I hear more of them, but they involve building the capacity of Portland State to serve the community and then the capacity of the community to create new jobs and to stabilize and expand the quality of life that we have here. Mark Abrams of the Education Standing Committee has the privilege of the second question. Mark. Thank you. Dr. Romelli, Portland is the largest metropolitan area in the United States without a comprehensive research library, and we may also be the largest city where no public university offers a PhD in English literature, history, and many other liberal arts and social sciences. Will that likely ever change? If so, when? And will PSU be the answer? PSU is the answer. It will change, and we're working on it. <laughs> What we're doing actually is in the process of assessing our assets and considering what the needs are in Portland, trying to invent fresh approaches to these fundamental scholarly fields so that when we develop doctoral programs in the arts and sciences, they will have a special meaning for the discipline in the 90s rather than trying to recreate what's already available either elsewhere in the state or in the region. So, for example, in thinking about history, I'm very interested in an idea that's circulating about Western American history, uh, a possible association with the Oregon Historical Society. We've been talking about working together on programs. So our model is not to recreate the fine examples that are around us throughout the country, but to develop a Portland version of them, a regional version, a national version of a different way of approaching important scholarly questions. So we are indeed going to do that, and it's going to be one of the most fun things we do in this decade, is invent new ways of thinking about the world. And it will be done here, and it will be done at Portland State. Molly Ingram, City Club member and PSU alumni board member, not quite an objective observer here. Uh, you've given us a couple of great ideas for how we can support the university, one through supporting tax reform and the other through pulling out our own checkbooks. I think both those are great ideas. What else would you suggest to us as City Club members uh, that we can do to support your efforts and participate more directly in what's happening at Portland State? There are a number of possibilities. The first is to realize what an important asset we are and to build us into your thinking when you're imagining the future. I, I gave the example of a number of recent studies where education as, a, as an important part of the infrastructure or the, the future of Portland got bare notice at all. I'm thinking of a number of materials prepared for potential companies or people who would invest in Portland, giving all the assets of Portland the jewel on the Willamette, and not even mentioning we have any educational institutions. I just saw some of those the other day. 
I looked at the AAA map, and you can't find Portland State on it. I looked at the PAL map, and there are all these things saying PSU in the names of our buildings, but never the word Portland State. The same thing's true for the Association for Portland Progress. It has a beautiful map, but Portland State as a name isn't on it. So there's a way in which both geographically and intellectually, those of you who believe in what we're trying to do and who want to be part of it can help just by acknowledging we exist. Uh, it sounds rather fundamental, but I met a, an important executive whom I persuaded to serve on my president advisory board who said, oh, Portland State, oh, that's that dark spot uptown. <laughs> so I went by one evening, working late, as presidents do, and we do have lighting, but... <laughs> and somebody else calls it the gray zone. I heard that yesterday. Well, we're a little gray, it's winter, you know. <laughs> Take a look at us in the fall, we're magnificent. But uh, I, the reason I start at that most fundamental level is we are the institution that the land forgot. And if you will accept and acknowledge that not only Portland State, but the network of educational services that serve this region are a major asset of Portland. It should be one of the top items on your list of why a person ought to come here to live why a company ought to build a branch office here or expand, why a company thinking of fleeing should please not, and so on. Beyond that, being willing, as so many people are here, to volunteer their time and their talent to help us invent a university is the next most basic thing because an urban university exists only through the imagination and support of the people it serves in a much more fundamental way than the more traditional institutions with which I've been associated in the past. And so keep those checks coming. Anybody who would like to be a president's associate, $1,000, send the check to me, and you'll get to go to dinner with me sometime. <laughs> I accept all donations willingly. If you'd like to give more, Earl Mackey is in the back of the room, and we'll see you on the way out. Earl, where are you, dear? Uh, yeah. There's Earl. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam President. My name is Naomi Menken. I'm a City Club member, and I am the wife of a graduate of the Graduate School of Business at PSU, and I can attest to the amount of money I had to shell out to put my husband through college. It ain't cheap. I have some suggestions that are based on discussions that my husband and I had over that two and two and a half year period where he was a student and also an assistant, graduate assistant to the dean of the business school. Number one, increase professor classroom hours to 25 to 30 hours a week. Some of them put in less than half that, at least they did at the time he was in school. Can May we have your question, please? My, my question is, would you agree with these suggestions? <laughs> Or, like, or disagree, either what way. What I'd like you to do, if possible, is this is precisely the kind of input we need, but I think not on airtime, on the sense that there are probably other people wanting questions. Could you arrange to send me a note with the ideas you have? Because what I'm after is to have people give us suggestions. There are many ways I could respond to your particular suggestions, but in fact, it would probably occupy the remainder of the time. For instance, the usual contact time for a faculty member in any educational system is defined in terms of classroom hours. The maximum that is given usually in community colleges is 15 hours. The usual amount in a university is nine. But in addition to that, at least three hours per classroom time are spent preparing for those classes. In addition, our faculty have research, uh, community service assignments, and other activities that occupy on the average 55 hours a week. Okay. Could, do you have a specific question other than would I entertain suggestions or would you like to go? My question was just simply what you, what you would do with these ideas. Um, Could you give me just one more and then we can... Okay, an, an example. I know that a lot of money is put into things like the football program and basketball and whatnot. Could that money not be better used applying it to, say, um, professor salaries, uh, scholarships, things of okay. that sort. Let me speak of that. In the colleges of Oregon State system, there is instructional money in the sports program. 
that is Eastern Oregon, Western Oregon, and Southern Oregon pay a portion of the salaries of coaches and some other operating costs for their, uh, for their uh, intercollegiate sports. At the universities, University of Oregon, Oregon State, and Portland State, there is no state money in the programs, nor is there any instructional resource there. In our particular case, the budget for our sports program comes from season ticket purchases, gate receipts, corporate uh, donations, uh, advertising revenue, and an allocation from our incidental fees, which are provided by student leadership each year when they review their budget. So there's, in fact, no money that I could reassign from our sports programs to our academic programs. There's not one dime of my tax money in the sports program. Not one dime. That's the best news I've heard in a long time. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Walter Roberts, City Club member, and just moved here a few years ago from Colorado. So I'm observing Portland grow and, and show up like a model in a number of areas. And this summer I had the opportunity to participate in the International Society of the System Sciences conference hosted by Portland State University. And um, my question is, is, has to do with what I perceive as a really very creative, um, bold, and new opportunity for the university to interact with the community and for the whole community to benefit in a rather synergistic sort of way. And I wonder if you feel um, somewhat alone or unique in your vision and uh, quest uh, as a leader, and if there are other models or similar endeavors occurring in our country or uh, anywhere in the world. So, As a matter of fact, the urban university model is new enough that there is no common language for it, but there are a number of examples around the country of local interpretations of it that fit the particular region where the university is located. The tag is a little different for each one. For example, there is a very good model in Virginia, which is called by them the interactive university. That's George Mason. There is an interesting model at Wright State. They call themselves the Metropolitan University. Uh, there are several other examples. The University of, of Houston at Clearwater, I think, calls itself the participatory university. What we're all trying to get from this language is a sense of connection. And so what you will see is a series of efforts that are really designed with a particular community in mind. Therefore, although the core of each of these institutions is the same, fine liberal arts and sciences, beyond that core are a series of professional schools whose theory and practice really match up nicely with whatever the the special character of their region may be. So you could not take Portland State, lift it up magically, and plop it into Minneapolis or Houston or New York and, and retain its basic character because we reflect already so clearly where we are and who we interact with. And that's, that is, in fact, a national model emerging. It was defined 10 years ago in the Higher Education Act in Title 11 as the Urban Grant University although the federal government has never actually sponsored through Title XI any development of these institutions the way they have the land grant and the sea grant and the, it seems to me there was another grant, I've lost which one it was, space, space grant. Uh, but air, land, and sea is taken care of, how about the city? And so we do hope that we can not only retain that authorization in Title XI of the Higher Education Act, but in fact secure some funding for institutions of this type what we hope is we'll be so good at it that we will be a major model for how to make it work. But we do have some sister institutions, that probably about 30 of them, that in one way or another and at different points are in the same task of defining a new kind of institution. That's why it's fun to be here, because Portland State is where the, where the action is. I got tired of trying to defend a model that was very good but that other people didn't understand, I figured I'd come here and invent one that you'd have to like because you helped build it.
I'm Mimi Bushman, City Club member. Dr. Romaley, the group of presidents that began, uh, Portland area presidents that began meeting during the work of the Governor's Commission, has that group continued to meet? And if so, what are the prospects? You're referring to the Council of Presidents. It actually began meeting informally before the commission was organized and then became an important part of the commission's work. There are seven presidents, and we are meeting. We've been meeting once a month. We're holding a all-day meeting on the 1st of February. Our purpose at that meeting being to define a mission for ourselves as a group of public and private institutions. There are really two elements to that mission which are related but are quite different in character. One is the great university presence in Portland centering around a research library and all that that entails to create an intellectual community. And the other agenda, which is really more an agenda for uh, a primary consideration by Portland State and its public university and college partners, is a social economic development agenda that would serve Portland in particular. Stuart Weiss, City Club member. Did you say uh, you were planning on uh, cutting enrollment or that that was going to be a uh, something you have to look at for Portland State, given Measure 5? It will be very difficult for us to maintain our current level of enrollment, but I very carefully didn't say what our enrollment would be, because our first effort is to see how much can we reduce our operating costs, thus saving money, thus preserving both program options and variety of programs and quality and our capacity to serve students. I'm sure that our enrollment will be smaller next fall than it is today, because there's no way the Portland State can sustain a cut of, at the best, 6.5%. That's our best case scenario uh, without some limitation of our capacity. But our first commitment is to preserve our level of service. Yeah, I would, because it'd be like saying, in order to save money, we'll cut sales. That's precisely it. I mean, so in other words, uh, couldn't you maintain enrollment? If you maintain enrollment and raise tuition, that sounds like a benefit. I mean, at least the difficulty is the timing, because we have to have $4.1 million out of our budget in, in the best case scenario with what we know today, mindful that all that could change as the session develops and as other thoughts come in play. Oh. But it, we, in other words, we won't have the money to pay for the faculty and staff who would serve those students. So we're in a kind of interesting spiral in which we can try to get more students to allow us to offer more instruction, but it's very difficult for those two things to match up because the dollars don't come in at the same time as we need to sign the paycheck. I'll make it quick. You're a graduate of UCLA. You know that there are thousand, there's a thousand students in a classroom in some cases, and UCLA is a world-class institution. Why, why is it so terrible to have, uh, you know, instead of 35 students, you have 40 students. It's not great, but it's... Uh, <laughs> the reason we can't do that is we don't have enough large classrooms. Our average classroom size holds 30. In other words, our university, which is really mostly not buildings designed to be a university, we have a former elementary school, a former high school, et cetera, are designed for a particular class size. And we're in fact looking now at what it would cost to knock out some partitions that we think could be moved in one of our buildings to create some larger classrooms. If we could do that, we could then bring in more students in those programs where larger class size instruction would work the problem is that we have particularly prided ourselves on closer interaction between our students and faculty and amongst the students. And so somewhere there's a trade-off between quality and access. But we are trying to make some move toward increasing our ability to, to teach some large classes where our faculty feel that that's acceptable. Thank you. We're out of time. Thank you very much for a wonderful report on Portland State. There is a ray of hope. We are adjourned.